So the parable of the mustard seed is a powerful little parable that delivers a, a lot of rich teaching for us to apply in our Christian lives. And Jesus tells this parable about the kingdom of God, a kingdom that is not just of this world, but also concerns the life to come. The kingdom of God certainly does pertain to this life, how we are to live here, how we are to participate as citizens of God's kingdom and seek to bring His kingdom to bear in our society. But it's also on how the life to come, the not yet of salvation and of eternal life. And the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, is like a mustard seed. Now the first thing about the mustard seed is that it has to be planted in the field. It's basically worthless so long as it remains a seed. It has to be planted in order to grow and to multiply. And in the kingdom of God, it appears that size does not matter. The mustard seed is the smallest of all their seeds, and yet it produces the largest of garden plants, becoming a tree. The kingdom of God begins with a tiny seed, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But its small beginnings do not hamper it from extravagant growth. And finally, the purpose of the kingdom of God is other-oriented. It is not selfish. It's oriented towards the needs and the blessings of others. The mustard tree doesn't serve itself. It is there for the birds of the air to perch in, and of course it also produces mustard, which, if you didn't know, is the second most popular spice in the world. Interesting. So this little parable, these two little verses in the Gospel of Matthew, contain rich teaching. Now we've only scratched the surface, right? But they contain rich teaching for us, and it's just one of hundreds of parables in the New Testament Gospels. But have you ever wondered, have you ever asked yourselves, did Jesus really say that? Now, in, in, in my Bible, which is packed away in my van for the trip back to Kentucky, those words appear as red letter words. I, I have another Bible with me, and I think it, it does not have red letter words. Does anybody have a red letter Bible? Lincoln, hold up your red letter Bible for us in the middle of the Gospel of Matthew. It's not here, though. Oh, it's not here. Well, okay. thing is like red letter. <laughs> Michael, is that a red letter Bible? No, I think it's like a translation, but I Okay. Well, you can highlight all the words of these. Anyways, in the red letter Bible, the words, there we go, Carlos got one, okay? The red letter Bible, the words of Jesus are in red letters, hence the red letter Bible. And that is for our sake so that we remember and understand that these are not just the words of, 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 of Stephen or of Dorothy. These are the words of God spoken through the mouth of Jesus of Nazareth when he was incarnate as a human being. So the Red Letter Bible tells us this is what Jesus said. In the 1980s, a group of scholars known as the Jesus Seminar began publishing their theory that most of the Red Letter words aren't actually supposed to be Red Letters. Jesus didn't actually say that. In their professional democratic opinion, they, they voted using colored beads. Um, most of the words attributed to Jesus, 80% of them, were not his. Rather, their later attributions to him. The Gospels, they are were unreliable, colored by theology. They say, and I quote, that the historical Jesus has been overlaid by Christian legend, myth, and metaphysics, and thus scarcely resembles the Christ figure presented in the Gospels and worshipped by the Church today. So are the red letter words really what Jesus said? Historic Christianity has always embraced the New Testament Gospels as a reliable historical record of the words, deeds, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Richard Bauckham writes, There is no doubt that the Jesus of the Church's faith through the centuries has been a Jesus found in these Gospels. Christian faith has trusted that in these texts we encounter the real Jesus. And it is hard to see how Christian faith and theology can work with a radically distrusting attitude to the Gospels. In other words, he says that the Church of the Ages has always trusted that this is the real Jesus, that the red letter words are indeed from the mouth of Christ. You know, it's a funny thing. When, when I was teenager, if, if Kelvin had come to me and said, Tawa, you need to hear what God says. You see this, what God says in the Bible. He says, you need to listen to that. And I would say, why? Why should I listen to what's written in some book by some guy that I don't know thousands of years ago? 
A skeptic isn't just going to listen to the Bible and say, oh, okay, I, I, I understand, I believe. They need to be convinced that what is there applies to them and is from God. So if we want our skeptical friends to accept what the Gospels tell us about Jesus, that He is the Son of God who came to live a perfect life as an example for us, to die as an atoning sacrifice for our sins, and that He rose again to assure us of our own resurrection. If we want them to believe this, we need to give them reasons, good reasons, good evidence, that point to the reliability of the texts which we trust and believe. Are the Gospels accurate biographies of Jesus? Did Jesus really say what the Gospels say that He said? Did He really do what the Gospels say that He did? Are there good reasons for accepting the historical reliability of the Gospels? This morning I want to share with you just briefly six compelling reasons that we can trust the historical reliability of the Gospels and present these reasons to our friends as reasons that they too should trust them. The first is that the Gospels present themselves as eyewitness accounts or as accounts derived from eyewitnesses. The beginning of Luke's Gospel, he writes, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the Word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Now notice the emphases that Luke makes here. First, his account accords with that of those who were eyewitnesses. Luke does not say, I was an eyewitness of this, but rather that this account comes from those who were eyewitnesses. Second, he has carefully investigated the events surrounding Jesus of Nazareth. He doesn't say, ah, I thought this stuff would be good for people to read and believe, so that's what I'm writing down. No, he says, I've carefully investigated, and then what I'm presenting to you is what falls from a historical investigation. And finally, he presents his gospel as an orderly account of Jesus' life. It's not just slapped together. It's an orderly account. And when we talk about Luke's Gospel, we want to remember as well the book of Acts, which Luke also wrote. And in several passages in Acts, Luke slips into first-person plural talk, talking about we. Instead of talking about them and they, he talks about we and us. Acts chapter 16, verse 10, after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia. And again in chapters 20, 21, 27, and 28, Luke talks about we did this, and we went there, this happens to us. Luke was an eyewitness of a lot of what happened in the book of Acts. Furthermore, he was an associate of Paul. He's traveling with Paul. That's why he's writing first person plural. And therefore, he had access not only to Paul's testimony about Christ, but also to the eyewitness accounts of the other apostles, James, John, and Peter, whom Paul had contact with. And so it's very reasonable to conclude that Luke's gospel is an eyewitness testimony. That what Luke is doing is he's going and interviewing those who were eyewitnesses of what happened in Christ's life. And he's recording their memories, their recollections of Christ's ministry. The Gospel of John, the last Gospel to be written down, somewhere around AD 95, about 65 years after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. But the Gospel right here insists that this is a trustworthy eyewitness account of what truly happened. John chapter 21, verses 24 and 25 claims that this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well, and if every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Now, this passage suggests a couple of things. First, that the Gospel is not exhaustive. Right? It's not recording everything that happened in the life and ministry of Christ. Because if it did, there would be no room for all the books. Second, it's possible that the words in the Gospel of John were not written down, all of them, by the Apostle John himself, but perhaps by some of his associates. Right? We know that his testimony is true. That sounds like other people talking about the Apostle John and his testimony being true. But thirdly, this being the case, they are recording faithfully John's eyewitness testimony. What John recollects of the ministry of Christ and that his followers are writing down to be carried forward. Now, we have here a claim to be eyewitness testimony. Luke, in 
and John. And Luke and John are the two that are most generally dealt with. So that's why we focus on them. But Luke and John both claiming to be eyewitness accounts of the life of Christ. Why should we believe them? Now it would be all fine and dandy if Stella said, Hey, I saw this happen. All we have at that point is her claim to have seen something. How do we know that Stella is telling the truth? That she is an eyewitness of what she claims to be. Well, the second reason to accept the reliability of the Gospels is that they were written relatively close to the time of the events that they relate. Now, almost all scholars agree that Mark is the earliest Gospel written somewhere around the year 65. Um, others argue it's written as early as the year 50, which is less than 20 years after the death of Christ. Matthew and Luke written between 60 and 80, John around 80, 95, and this means that when the New Testament Gospels were written down and began to circulate amongst Christian churches, there still would have been hundreds, maybe even thousands of eyewitnesses alive, people who had been there at the Sermon on the Mount, who had heard the teaching of Christ, people who had seen the miracles of Christ, were still alive when Mark, Matthew, and Luke, for sure, are being circulated. Now that means a couple of things. First of all, it means that there is vast opportunity for the gospel writers to verify what they're writing about. They can go to the people and talk to them and have their records written down. But it also means that if Matthew, Mark, and Luke are making things up, that there are people still alive around to say, Hey, that's not how it happened. I was there. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what Jesus did. And what's strange is that there's an absolute absence of any of that. There, there's no hint in any ancient literature, in any ancient writings or um, inscriptions or anything uh, of anybody disputing what's recorded in the Gospels and saying, no, 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 that's not what Jesus said. No, that's not what Jesus did. There's affirmation that yes, these are eyewitness accounts. So the Gospels are early enough to contain authentic eyewitness testimony because they're written very close to the time of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. The third reason to accept them as reliable and trustworthy is that the Christian Church has always acknowledged them to be such. From the first century onward, Christians have recognized that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are historical records of Jesus' life. Not just that they're good stories to teach us something, but that they are accurate historical records of what happened. There is no debate within the church until the rise of critical scholarship during the Enlightenment. When the Gospels claim eyewitness status and the church historically recognizes them as reliable and trustworthy, we better have very strong reasons if we want to reject the reliability. Now, question, what about other Gospels? Other accounts of Jesus' life and ministry which are not in our New Testament? Now, a couple of years ago, there was the Gospel of Judas that made headlines around the world. There was a nice little documentary about it and a little book published about it. Um, three years ago, the Da Vinci Code came out and argued, very wrongly, that there were over 80 Gospels of Jesus' life until the Catholic Church whittled them down to four acceptable censored Gospels. So what about these other Gospels about Jesus? Now, we don't have time to go deeply into it. But the simple fact is that within the early Christian church, the Orthodox Christian church, the early church fathers from the first century through to the fourth did not recognize any extra canonical gospel, that means any gospel outside of the New Testament, as being an authentic eyewitness account. Now there's early church leaders like Clement, Papias, Irenaeus, Justin, Tertullian, and they quote copiously from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they cite them as authoritative accounts of what happened. But they do not quote the other Gospels in the same way. The Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas, and so on. They never mention them as acceptable accounts. They do sometimes, however, cite them as untrustworthy accounts, written later by people that didn't have connections to the eyewitnesses of what happened in Jesus' ministry. And if you glance through some of the other accounts of Jesus' life, you should recognize quickly why the early church did not accept them as true historical accounts of Jesus' life. One of the Gospels is an amusing one. It's called the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. And in this Gospel, um, the, the person who writes it tries to imagine what it would have been like when Jesus was a boy. Um, you know, being God incarnate, he, he would have had powers that other little boys didn't have. And so one of the accounts of the Gospel of Thomas has um, a schoolmate kind of mocking Jesus and, and making 
fun of him, and Jesus strikes him dead. And it's like, well, see, that's what you get if you make fun of God. And so he strikes him dead. And uh, another account has Jesus um, basically being insubordinate to his teachers at, uh, at, at Hebrew school and, and showing them that he knows way, way, way more than them and kind of mocking them and belittling them. So just imagining what it would have been like when Jesus was a boy. Um, from my perspective, it doesn't accord with the Jesus that we see in the Gospels. Um, but it's imagine an account, right? How, how many of us would love to know what it was like when Jesus was a kid? You know, we really don't see. There's one little story in Luke, and that's all we see of Jesus kind of between the ages of two and three. That's all we get. It's that one little story in Luke, where they're in the temple, and his family leaves, and he stays behind. And that's all we have. And so, yeah, it'd be fascinating if we knew. And so sometimes what the, these non-canonical Gospels did was they filled in the blanks. They said, well, maybe this is what it would have been like when Jesus was a boy. There's another Gospel called the Gospel of Peter, written in the late 2nd century at the earliest, um, largely copied from Matthew and John. And it has this account of the scene of Jesus' resurrection. And one of the things you'll notice, if you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and their accounts of the resurrection of Christ, none of them describe what actually happens at the tomb. And so again, you have these early Christians who are like, well, what did it look like? I mean, in some ways, they were a lot like us. They want to know these things. What was it like when Jesus was a kid? What would it have been like at the resurrection if you had been there at the tomb to see it? What would it have been like? What would you have seen? And so this is what the Gospel of Peter imagines it'll look like. The stone cast before the entrance rolled away by itself and moved to one side. The tomb was open and both young men entered. They saw three men emerge from the tomb, two of them supporting the other, with a cross following behind them. The heads of the two reached up to the sky, but the head of the one they were leading went up above the skies. And they heard a voice from the skies, Have you preached to those who are asleep? And a reply came from the cross, Yes. So in the Gospel of Peter, at the scene of the resurrection, you have two massively tall men, hundreds of feet tall, supporting the third man, Jesus, who's emerging from the tomb, who said reaches up above the skies, followed by a walking cross, which talks. Now, early Christians were not foolish. They were not naive. Like the Gospel writer Luke, they sought to establish what they believed on solid historical and evidential grounds. They did not just swallow every tale or story or myth about Jesus. Only what was well-grounded and well attested by eyewitness testimony. And that is why the four canonical Gospels were accepted, and others, like Judas or Peter, were not. Now, a fourth reason to accept the historical reliability is the Gospels themselves, the internal evidence of the Gospels. There's details and events within the Gospels that strongly support their status as reliable eyewitness documents. Now, Michael, can you close your eyes for me for a minute? Okay. If we wanted to establish after today that Michael really was here this morning, we, we want him to be able to tell us some things that demonstrated that, yes, he was here. So we would ask Michael, for example, um, who is sitting directly in front of you, Michael? It's tough to be proud of this one. Calvin and Stephanie, very good, okay. Um, who was uh, running the AV? Lincoln, sorry, that's not fair. He's always in the AV, right? Um, oh, goodness. Who is playing guitar this morning? Yeah, Joyce. Who is playing piano? Bianca. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mike. You can open your eyes. Okay? It's not easy being put on the spot, but thank you. Okay? But you want to ask some questions like that. Now, if we had a photograph of this morning, it would bear out that, hey, yeah, Michael got most of those details right. You might have forgot the piano player, but that's okay. Um, at least he didn't, he just said, I don't remember, right? He didn't, he didn't wake up a name and say, um, uh, Calvin Kwong, right? He didn't pick a name out of a hat, right? But he remembered who was sitting in front of him, who was playing guitar, who was doing the AV. And so you want to have these details that, that kind of inform the story. When police seek an eyewitness account of what happened at a crime scene, they do the same thing. They, they look for incidental details that only somebody who was there would know. When, when I was brought when I was a teller at Scotiabank, um, they kept asking me, what were they wearing? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember. I'm a terrible eyewitness. But a lot of tellers, women particularly, if they had been the one who was robbed, I was thankful they weren't, they would have remembered what the guy was wearing. They probably would have remembered whether he had crooked teeth and all that stuff. I 
didn't, okay? But those kind of details support a claim to be an eyewitness. And we have a lot of them in the Gospels. John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Now, as the story goes on, Jesus heals the man. Um, it's on the Sabbath day, and so this creates a big ruckus, and the Pharisees got all upset because Jesus is working on the Sabbath day. And that's kind of the point of the story. But notice the details that John includes in his account. Details that have nothing to do with the main point of the story. The main point of the story is Jesus healing on the Sabbath day. That's the focus. That's what John is relating to us. But notice all of the details that he includes in the story. Now, how long has the man been an invalid? 38 years. 38 years, right. Now, if you were the first person to hear this story, my reaction, sorry, please forgive me, my reaction would be, who cares? Who cares how long he's been an invalid? Okay, he's been an invalid a long time, just a long time. But he's been an invalid for 38 years, a precise number. He doesn't even round it off to 40, which is a nice round Jewish number. He says precisely, 38 years. Notice that John provides the exact name of the gate, and the pool, the sheep gate, and the pool of Bethesda, and even the number of surrounding covered colonies, five colonies. Now Vanessa and I both enjoy fiction. We, we both like a good mystery story, a good detective novel, um, or movie. A couple of weeks ago, actually it might be a month now, she was saying how she doesn't really care for, you know when you get a long novel, you know a good six or seven hundred page, it's got lots of long descriptive passages in it, right? That describe kind of how things looked, and uh, the character of people, and the smells, and the sights, and so on. I love those passages, because they, they bring it to life, right? A really good author can make it feel like you're there. Vanessa's different. She just wants to get to the story, right? She wants the story. There's, there's nothing wrong with it, okay? I love those details that an author can provide, and that is what John is doing here, is he is providing these details to bring it to life, so that you can imagine yourself being there. Now, for us it's a little more difficult to place ourselves there because we've never been to Jerusalem in the first century. Probably none of us have ever been to Jerusalem at all. But for those that John is writing to, they may be able to say, ah, I remember, I remember the Pool of Bethesda. Yeah, I remember the sheep gate. Okay, I can picture it. I can see myself there. It was when he provides these details that allow his audience to enter into the story, to see themselves being there. Now, I should also mention in passing that sometimes if one is a skeptic, if one does not want to believe, it doesn't matter how many details are there, they're still not going to believe that he was really there. In situations like this, a critical scholar will claim, well, well John wasn't really there. He just adds all of these details for, for the sake of it. Some of the details he adds from his memory. I mean, John's been to Jerusalem. Of course he remembers the Pool of Bethesda. Of course he remembers the Sheep Gate and so on. So he just... Puts that there so that you think he was there. And other details he just makes up. You know, a man being paralyzed for 38 years, he just makes that up so that you think it really happened. And for such scholars, the level of detail is not confirmation of eyewitness account, but rather is evidence of deliberate deception. So John's not trying to tell us what happened. He's trying to trick us into thinking that something happened that didn't really happen. In other situations, though, the same scholars will point to the absence of these details as evidence that John couldn't have been there. And in fact, in this very passage, if you look at the first verse, there's some imprecision there that a critical scholar will look at and say, Ha! I know that John wasn't there, because if he was there and he was Jewish, he would tell you what feast it was. He wouldn't say some time later there was a feast of the Jews. He would have told you what feast it was. No self-respecting Jew wouldn't do that. See, I know he wasn't there. So on the one hand, they will look at the incidental details that John does provide and say, see, John's trying to deceive you into thinking he was there. And yet on the other hand, they will point to the lack of a detail somewhere and say, see, that shows that John couldn't really have been there. John can't wait either way. He can't convince them that he saw what he says he saw. What's going on is that they're simply unwilling to admit that the Gospel accounts are eyewitness accounts. It doesn't matter what evidence and what arguments there are, they will not accept them as being
leaving out witness accounts because if they do so, you have to accept the grave implications that that has about who Jesus is and what he said and what he did. And now John chapter 5 is just one of hundreds of passages in the Gospels that have these incidental details that support the eyewitness status of the accounts. Now Richard Bauckham in his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, includes a lot more. It's a majestic, very impressive work. And if it's split into nice sections so that if you're interested most in, say, the Gospel of Matthew, it's got a nice big section on the Gospel of Matthew and so on. Great little book to work through. A fifth reason to believe that the Gospels are historical and accurate records is the evidential support. Now, if police are presented with a professed eyewitness of a crime, um, let's say again that Michael was an eyewitness of something that happened here. Police will look for, for some evidential support that yes, they were really here. Um, so again, if there was a photograph of church this morning, and they saw Michael in the photograph, they'd say, ah, okay, so he was here, so he was an eyewitness. Um, or if Michael says, I was sitting in the fourth pew from the back, and uh, you know, I rested my hands on the pew in front of me, they might dust it for fingerprints and find his fingerprints on it and say, ah, okay, his fingerprints are there, he really was there. Um, no, I mean, that's not a perfect analogy. But that's the kind of empirical support that they will look for to establish that, yes, somebody saw what they said they saw. And the same is true with the New Testament Gospels. Now, it's not always possible to find empirical or evidential support for what the Gospels claim. But sometimes it is, and that's where the discipline of archaeology comes in. What archaeologists do is they seek to find inscriptions, um, structures that either support or dispute, depending on their perspective, what the Bible says, and what other ancient documents say. It's not that archaeology is just concerned with the Bible, but that's what we're concerned with this morning. Now, one example has to do with John chapter 5 that we were just talking about. Now, for, for years and years, um, critical scholars pointed to John chapter 5 and said, see, I don't think this really happened. You know why? Well, first of all, we don't know of any sheep gate. And secondly, five covered colonies surrounding it, structurally, we're not sure that that works, and we have no structural record of anything like that in the archaeological record in Jerusalem. And so there's no empirical support for what we see here in John chapter 5, and what the details of where it happened. But, about 20 years ago, archaeological discoveries verified the identity and the name of the sheep gate by the pool of Bethesda, and found inscriptions on the stones there, as well as the presence of five porticos, or colonies there. And so, whereas John chapter 5 used to lack empirical support that this place really existed, now the archaeological evidence is there that yes, this place really was there. And again, this happens time after time after time, that archaeological finds support what the Gospels say. Um, now, we just look very briefly at one little example. If you're into looking for more, there's a couple of websites that are up there. This isn't one of my areas of particular passion, okay? So we've just covered it really, really briefly. But if you're interested in it, there's a couple of sites that you can check out on your own. So there's five kind of rational, evidential, or intellectual reasons to acknowledge the reliability of the New Testament Gospels. First is their claim to be eyewitnesses. Second is their early date, the Church's recognition of them as eyewitness accounts, the internal evidence, and the external evidence. But there's a sixth reason that we have for accepting the reliability and the trustworthiness of the Gospels. And it's an entirely different type of argument. It's not so much intellectual or academic as it is experiential. And the argument is this, that if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, whom the Gospels proclaim as Savior and Lord, that you will find the truth of the Gospels confirmed in your life. You will experience the release of forgiveness, reconciliation with God, you will receive abundant joy of life in Christ. You will be transformed, sometimes quickly, sometimes gradually, sometimes a combination of both. You will find yourself transformed into the image of Christ. The promises that God makes through the Gospels, you will find confirmed and borne out in your life. In some ways it's analogous to an argument that marital faithfulness is the best path to take in a romantic relationship, okay? Now there's many ways that I could go about it to convince you that this is true. I could point to the Bible and say, God says that the plan for romantic relationships is marriage, faithful marriage between one man and one woman, okay? And I could make a biblical argument. Then I could move and I could look at, at Lincoln's discipline of sociology. And I could say, you know, there's sociological surveys that show that the happiest people are those who are faithfully married, okay? That they 
um, relate being the most happy, the most satisfied in service. 